Good afternoon, everybody. So how do we recognise? How can I assist you in just recognising sometimes, despite good evidence, despite using good pathways, the wound's not responding how you would like, or as anticipated, or as expected? And I'd like to just say, that is it, the point we have to stop. And we have to stop and think about why. Why is that happening? And who do we, or have to, or might have to, involve to get the best outcome, but for the best quality of life for our patients? Um, and again, there's quite a bit to get to go, a bit to go through, but I'll try and bring us up to speed. We've seen lots of images of wounds. We know there is a whole array of different types of wound, uh, wounds, and I'm not here to talk about all of those different types. I have 30 minutes. In life and in wound care, we never see the same picture. But isn't that good? I think that's quite interesting, really, or else we'd all fancy the same person, wouldn't we? That'd be quite boring as well. Do we always see the same picture? Do you see one picture of a animal or two? Do you see both? I'm not going to ask you, but I'm sure you'll all be saying, I can see a frog, I can see a horse, I can see both. It's just the same when we're looking at wounds sometimes. I'm fortunate to have a week off. My colleague goes in. She may not see clearly the same picture as I'm seeing. And therefore, that really robust assessment of not just the wound, the patient, as we've talked about, is important. So no, it's not just a wound. A wound has a cause. There's always a cause, but we need to understand that cause. That cause will then help us to look at that holistic, robust patient assessment, wound assessment, which I'm not going to go into detail on. We've heard lots of really good, valuable points on that. But if we don't get a true picture of that etiology, how can we get a really clear picture of how we're going to successfully manage the wound or heal the wound? Because let's be honest, we'll be talking to you about some wounds that we may not heal, okay? And if we can ensure that and look at other elements that you've heard about today, about removing the barriers to those wound healings that are going to assist that wound to heal, reduce the bacterial burden, that's fantastic. But what we also must do is if we have those hidden diagnoses, hidden uh, etiologies that we're not sure of what to do, and we've heard about that, ensure you have that timely and appropriate referral on. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's what I've always said in my clinical work. If it's a concern to you, it doesn't matter your level of experience, whether you're a student, newly qualified, and 20 years experience, discuss it. Speak to somebody, because it'll make a huge difference. We heard today about Jocelyn saying, Sometimes care is a bit task orientated. If it's task orientated, we can often lead to uncoordinated care. And I love this slide. I use this slide everywhere I go. So sorry for guys who've seen it before. But doesn't it say a thousand things? But it does, doesn't it? And sometimes we are so busy in practice. I get that. We're pr busy in our own lives, in practice lives. We have so many things to do and we need to get that right. Um, so what I would like to highlight with you today is just a small snippet of some, what I call some red flags in tissue viability. And this is only from my own knowledge and experience. So, you know, if you are new into tissue viability, don't think that, that some of these diagnoses I'm going to share with you today, you will see every day in your practice because they are unusual. But I think they're things that even with just the visual image in your head and a little bit of the clinical signs and symptoms, you can help to save your patients a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, or even leading to loss of life or sepsis. So some of those conditions I want to address are autoimmune conditions, particularly looking at pyoderma and gang uh, gangrenosum and vasculitis. Don't worry about the terminology. Granulomas, malignant lesions, um, but I've, I've opted out on the gra granuloma bit because of the time, so, but that's okay. Vasculitis, just a quick show of hands. Who's ever seen anybody with a condition called, you know, tissue vasculitis or limb vasculitis? Yeah, and, and you see even in this room, there's quite an array of hands, isn't there? And some of us haven't. And when you first, I, I, I've always said to new, my staff, and not our staff in the audience, 
When you see somebody with either vasculitis or a pyoderma ulcer, you'll never forget it. It will always be imprinted on your mind. It's a very debilitating illness, and it's caused by inflammation, as you can see here, of the blood vessel walls and surrounding tissue. Now, normally, that can be seen, like you can see on this purple-type rash on the lower limb, very rapid onset. But I'll guarantee, as a tissue viability nurse, I don't always see it at that beginning stage. I tend to see it when it's ulcerated. But if we could see it early on or recognise that that's, there is something not right, not diagnose it necessarily on your own, but say this, you know, sudden onset, very painful, we need to refer this patient on. It's autoimmune connective tissue disease, very commonly associated with rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, and can be a reaction to a generalized systemic infection as well. Can be an adverse reaction to drugs. I've had a recent gentleman who was commenced on a new type of hypertensive drug and he had a systemic reaction resulting in vasculitis. And it could be also linked to other underlying malignancies. But in 50% of some of the cases, it's idiopathic. We don't know why it occurred. Despite all the tests, we test for rheumatoid arthritis, we test for all sorts of conditions, but we don't know why. It can be very localised or generalised, but it does require urgent diagnosis because if you've ever nursed anybody with this significant ulceration, pain is a huge issue. Risk of infection is a huge issue. They very, very, very much sometimes called the non-concordant problematical patient because they can't tolerate a lot of the treatments we're trying to implement. Um, so we need to work as an MDT team. They need that urgent diagnosis. So you'd be looking at your various blood screenings for inflammatory markers, um, vascular assessment, as we've talked about, histology of that tissue. Because with both this and pyoderma, without histology, we can't get a true um, diagnosis. It's extremely painful, as I've said, and rapid onset. You, you can almost see these wounds deteriorating in front of your eyes as you see these patients, if they're not having or receiving the right treatment. Okay, as I've just said, extremely painful. So you can see there that necrotic type tissue that develops really, really quickly. And that's why they're at risk, higher risk of infection, because we have to try and remove that devitalized tissue as quickly as possible using what debridement um, techniques you have available to you but certainly analgesia uh, is, is important here not always antibiotic therapy unless it's indicated and I think this is where I go back to Leanne's general concern we overuse those antibiotics but I think good wound bed preparation good skin care good cleansing is a way of reducing that bacterial burden and I've just put here very I, I don't routinely go in and start these patients on steroid therapy it's an MDT team approach okay you may be involved with your uh, GP initially but certainly these patients need referring on quite a few of our dermatology patients will see uh, dermatologists will see these patients um, if there's an underlying diagnosis though such as rheumatoid arthritis or another condition then that consultant is equally involved as well so it just depends on which pathway you go down um, but again, we have to look at immunosuppressive agents. Um, and I'm not going to list all of those. I've only got 30 minutes, but there's lots of good literature. There's very few RCTs, though. I'll tell you that now. There's very few RCTs. There's only one big RCT done in pyoderma, um, and that is a UK, UK uh, RCT. But again, um, but there is lots written about the condition and how we can help the patients. Analgesia and rest is definitely. Um, dressing changes, as we just talked about. What are you seeing within the wound bed? What are you seeing in the wound, uh, the surrounding tissue? Address both, but make sure that, um, not that we would make sure that dressings are painful, but it's certainly addressing that low traumatic dressing change. Using whatever acronym you use to remove the barriers to wound healing, such as times antimicrobial dressings if we require them, and compression if tolerated, because it is a painful condition. But these patients, if they can, respond very well to compression, because again, they get it in the limbs, you can have vasculitis in various parts of the body, but tend to be associated with quite a lot of edema. This is a patient that was admitted to one of our community hospitals. It doesn't look too severe, but that was on both legs. It can mimic in both limbs quite quickly. Um, 
in extreme pain, of course, we wanted to reduce bacterial burden and, and remove the devitalized tissue. So with good analgesia, could we wait for natural autolysis? Not particularly in this gentleman. So he did have some sharp debridement with good analgesia, but you can see the difference that makes straight away or, you know, within a matter of two days, how quick then? Because these patients could be immunosuppressed, okay, and we need to act quickly. Pyoderma is slightly different. It's an um, idiopathic inflammatory disease in some cases, but there are other reasons why it's present. And, and I, I, I agree with you, it's not something we come across every day in our practice, but when you do, you'll never forget it. And the classic, I love that picture because it classically shows what if pyoderma pyoderma ulcer looks like that purple demarked edge or the halo they call it and when you see a halo around a wound and I've got other pictures to show you start thinking about what is different about this wound why is it like that there are other subtle things you can look for as well 50% though can be related to underlying disease processes so it's a systemic problem the ulcer is not the cause remember I said at the beginning find the cause the cause is some underlying autoimmune problem within that patient. So I'm not saying for you on your own find the cause. What I'm saying is as a team, you find the cause, you start treating the patient as a whole, not just the whole in the patient. And guess what? It's slow and it's steady with these patients, but you will get move on and help them to heal. But patients with vasculitis un unmanaged or undiagnosed and certain pyodermas can die. That's how severe it can be. Okay. Um, I'll go through some of them. Quite significantly, if I start to see pyoderma ulcers or a patient I think has a, may have a pyoderma lesion, and lesions can be multiple or single, I start to think about certain autoimmune diseases. And the common ones tend to be around the bowel. So I'll start asking history about any bowel, inflammatory bowel conditions. And even if they haven't got a history, do we not need to start to investigate that if they've had any changes in the bowel or things, etc.? Now, pyoderma is very rare in children. But if you ever see a child with a pyoderma, and I don't know if my colleagues in the audience who phoned me a couple of years ago, and she diagnosed an 11-year-old boy with a pyoderma, and he'd been going to A&E for the last seven months with a most painful ulcer really painful also and of course he's 11 so everybody thinks he's knocked it or he's had a bite or it's a bit of trauma his mum didn't know what to do and my colleague had, I'd been presenting this a few months before at a different conference and she 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 just looked at it and said it's got that purple halo and it's not healing he's 11 and it's not healing okay and Cut a long story short, we kept in touch because she, you know, and uh, she went, they went off and did various tests and he had some underlying inflammatory bowel disorder. But you can see how, how working as a team, just having little telltale tips that you can think about. I'd also start thinking about hematological disorders. This can occur in patients with leukemias and various uh, other malig malignant conditions, hepatitis. Um, as I've just said, it can be idiopathic um, and associated, associated with that inflammatory disease. But it can also occur following uh, trauma, burns and surgery. Um, but really, a lot of the times, it's normally some autoimmune response within the patient. Um, I see quite... I don't see a lot because it, isn't, it is rare... But like I say, it's something that I think we misdiagnose and mistreat, not deliberately, might I had. Um, so these are some of the other conditions I've talked about, hepatic um, problems that might lead to pyodermas, rheumatoid, typically common in between 40 and 60 years of age. But like I say, it's rare in children, but be, be aware that children can develop this um, as well. Common on the lower limbs and the trunk, but I have seen pyodermas on the buttocks, uh, etc. but very common on there. Commences normally, sometimes if you ask a patient, because I'll guarantee you probably see it at this point, but sometimes if you ask your patients to go back, they'll tell you how it started maybe sometime as a little pustula. And, but that pustula broke down very quickly and became large. And as you can see, that very low picture talks about purple halo, bluish tinge to the wound bed. Almost in some areas, you may see a little bit of necro necrotic tissue. 
and that you know is quite classic of that pyodermas. It could be, as I've just said, multiple blisters on the epidermal layer and untreated it will become deeper and I've seen significant ulcers. When they tend to heal, and they will heal, they do often leave very fibro scarring, very sometimes shaped, um, you heal it called like a cross or a star shape. It's just the nature of how the fibro fibrosis comes together. There's various types and I haven't got a lot of time to talk to you about them all. The common one you will see will be the ulcerative pyoderma, um, simply to recognize very commonly associated with arthritis, leukemias, underlying blood disorders. Patient history may be, I saw a little rash, or I saw a little black mark, or I saw a little pustula, and it broke down really quickly. And the next thing, it's really painful. And when you see a small wound, you think, how can that be, because we are judgmental, how can that be painful? You know, my husband's only got it, my partner, has only got a sneeze, and he's like, oh God, he's got the man flu. But it is, it's the pain that, sorry, Andrew, it's the pain that gives it away. It is an excruciating, open, really good analgesia. Working with your pain management team is important for these patients, okay? Um, but again, you can see that purple edge, that demarcation of that edge and that tinge. And the tissue may look granular, but it's just through your own experience, you know it's not healthy granular tissue. Pustular pyoderma is, as it says, lots of painful pustulas, normally on healthy skin, but again, they have that marked halo around. Um, can lead to extensive ulceration. If you see that on a patient, it's very classically associated associated with, it's the end of the day, you know, this is not fair. Exacerbation of inflammatory bowel disorders. So start thinking about those underlying inflammatory bowel disorders. If there's no diagnosis, do we need to look at a diagnosis then? Of course we do, because you don't just ulcerate and have pustulas for no reason. But normally, if you resolve the inflammatory bowel disorder, this responds extremely well, okay? Um, Bullis pyoderma, lots of hemorrhagic. Can you see how painful that must be for a patient? Okay. This, the ulcers do tend to, and I don't know why, remain very superficial though and commonly on the arms. But if you start to see that and there's no other rationale why, then start to look at various blood tests for hematological malignancies and any problems there. Again, treat the underlying, that will respond. Okay. Um, vegetative. Now, this is the least typical, probably the, the least you will see. This reminds me of when you see something said, oh, they've got a bit of cellulitis or they've got a bit of a red leg, because this will be extremely painful for the patient. It doesn't tend to ulcerate. It's quite idiopathic. We don't really know what actually causes this. It could be a viral infection that the patient's come a little bit immunosuppressed. But this does respond very well um, with or without uh, systemic steroids or sometimes just a topical and finally peristomal pyodermas how many of you especially uh, specialists in the audience had a phone call to say I've got a stomacite that's overgranulated and you can get a stomacite that overgranulates and I have okay and we try everything or they you know you try all your overgranulation pathways and everything but you can get a pyoderma around a stomacite and all the will in the world, you're not going to heal that unless we look if what, what the problem is. Is it the irritable bowel disorder that's not under control? Is there a malignancy? Because the patient could have had abdominal malignancy, et cetera, et cetera. But you need the MDT team to work with you on that, okay? Often it's diagnosed as a, a stitch abscess or overgranulation or an infection. Okay, diagnosis I've been through, I'm not going to go through it all, but you need to, you need to widen the team. So dependent on, uh, you would certainly be involved with the GP at the first instance, and then deciding which specialist route and which specialist pathway you would go down. You definitely need the support of your tissue viability vascular, whichever specialism. If the patient has any mental health issues, you need the involvement of your mental health teams. Because we, we did at our conference, had a really good member of, uh, of our um, nearby locality that spoke on mental health issues and it is good but again all those tests you do not have to do all those tests on all of those patients it's finding out the cause it's elimination to aid diagnosis mainstay is targeting and moderating the immune system and again i'm not going to go and list lists but you need to target the patient and the wound early detection 
don't be afraid to ask for help. I love technology. I love photographs, because if we have four in our team, and we have a great wound healing service, but we have four that can go across the whole county. We cannot be everywhere, like I'm sure most of you in this audience are nodding with me. You send me a picture of one of those wounds, and I know, and by looking, you will recognize as well, we need to involve somebody in this. Yes, I'm going to support the staff with this wound, but we need desperately to widen, start with some diagnostics, start with the assessment, get the patient comfortable, involve the patient, see how it started, what might have caused it. Local therapies I've talked about, you can have local steroids, okay? So steroid ointment, steroid creams. Everything we tell you not to do with a steroid ointment is to put it on an open wound. In this case, please, we will be asking you to as a team. We may do interlesional steroid injections. Sounds painful, but they respond extremely well. And I'll tell you something now, helps with pain relief as well for your patients. There may be systemic um, steroids, and I would say dependent on the severity. And so that may be oral, and it may be IV. Antibiotics are not the mainstay here unless in infection is diagnosed and indicated. You may use some antimicrobials to help with that anti-inflammatory anti effect because of the inflammation. Further research and evidence talks about using cyclophosphamides, those types of drugs. That is not something I would prescribe, but they can be very effective in severe cases. But again, they can come with their risk factors, so just be mindful of that and helping you, um, advising your patients about the risk of infection particularly on some of those drugs due to them being immunocompromised. Others, methotrexate, some TNF inhibitors have been used, um, thalidomide and plasma exchange. Again, not something we would do, but I had a patient who was admitted um, to a, a Midlands hospital with severe pyoderma who was given thalidomide by IV and did respond extremely well. So again, it's, it's widening that team. Surgery actually is not an indicator for these types of wounds. It's been found that actually it, it can exacerbate the wound because of the nature of the inflammatory response, then the immuno response. Um, debride the wounds, of course, but you know, if you think, oh, well, we'll just remove it. But the only part of, of, of taking a bit of tissue is the importance of, of histology. You really need to get histology. And let the microbiologists, histologists, know what you're looking, not what you're looking for, but what you see. Because if you just put a, 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 put a biopsy in a pot, send it off, write minimal data, what can they see? You know, give them as much detail as what you can actually see. If you can see a purple halo, put purple halo. They, they, they do know. And if not, pick the phone up and speak to them. But this, to me, is the most important for the patient quality of life because these wounds do not heal overnight. They take time. So you really have to engage with the patient, explain to them what's happening because they think it's a wound. What are you doing, Joy? You're not healing my wound. You're O+. Plus. Why isn't that dressing not working? You've got to talk. This is a body. This is your body. This is systemic. And we need to work together with you. So don't go out and have your 40 cigarettes and your two bottles of wine tonight okay, if we want your wound to heal, okay? We have to work together. Your body will respond accordingly. So early recognition, as I've said, and I talked to you about the scar tissue. Advise your patients that the scar tissue might be significant, but you, we can get it right. I like to, to show you the positives, that with the right MDT team approach, with the right um, treatment, you know, they can heal. The unfortunate thing is between 30 and 4% of patients who develop a vasculitis or pyoderma can reoccur. So again, it's showing patients what to look out for because the sooner we can see them, if they have a slight lesion or a painful area, the quicker we can respond. So finally, just want to talk to you about malignancy. We all are aware of skin cancers, but in wounds, I always say, if I'm teaching about this, it is difficult. We haven't got x-ray vision, but it's like all of the two um, types of wounds I've said to you before, if it's not responding to evidence-based care, good treatments, good pathways, something is not right. 
okay? Even if they've had a diagnosis of a venous leg ulcer, it's not healing despite compression, despite good wound management and wound bed preparation. There is some other cause. Something is not allowing that wound to heal. If it's getting bigger, if it's over granulating, if we're talking about cancers, if it bleeds easily, you know, or just, do you ever have that gut feeling? It just doesn't look right. Take a picture, share it with your colleagues, share it with your you nurse know, specialists, share it with your GP. These are two patients that presented at clinic. The patient on the top had been going, no disrespect at all to the practice nurse, been going to the practice nurse for two and a half years with a small wound. And you would look at that and think that is a small wound. And the basal cell carcinoma is they crossed over and you think, great, sealed. Guess what? A week later, the crust comes off. You've still got that wound underneath. Sometimes looking a little bit over granulated, doesn't normally cause much pain, can bleed sometimes easily. But why is it doing that? They've worn the compression hosiery or they've had the compression bandaging. We need to stop and say, could this be, what is the cause? The only way you're going to, going to diagnose that is a biopsy. So if your TVNs do that, that's fab, GPs, but it needs biopsy. So that patient had a basal cell carcinoma, both of these patients successfully removed, healed in two weeks. Great. Nice thing with the basal cell, if there's a nice thing, they don't generally spread, hence because they're in the basal cell layer of the epidermis. Um, you know, so, but it's still a form of cancer, so you still have to educate and support your patients with that. The squamous cell carcinoma can be misdiagnosed, and I have seen in my career probably seven patients who, I mean, if you look at a wound, sometimes, yes, that's very overgranular, but if I could show you a picture of the first man I saw with a squamous cell that had, been had a diagnosis of venous leg ulceration, he got lipodermatosclerosis, all the signs and symptoms, but he was six years in compression bandaging and still not healed. It's not, still not reduced in size. So we did say, I couldn't biopsy at that time, so I asked one of the consultants to do it, and he had a squamous cell. Now, with squamous cell, they can metastasize and they can spread, and with the gentleman, it had spread through his lungs. Um, it had also gone into the bone, and he was offered amputation and then further radiotherapy, chemotherapy. He declined that. He said, I was born with my leg, I'll die with my leg. He was in his late 80s. His choice, but he was aware, and he made that informed choice. Um, but you can imagine, the nurses felt really bad. The clinicians actually felt really bad about that. But if you just sometimes stop and say, why? Why, and could there be another cause? Both um, that patient on our left was uh, my colleague Louise, saw that lady, and um, guess what? She, she, think she, she, she knew it was a carcinoma, but she took a picture, and it was just to say, I think this is something suspicious to you. And again, that was, that was a resident in a home. But again, that isn't knocking staff, it's just giving you that support. Melanomas we need to be aware of. We know that, okay? But any lesions that suddenly develop or have developed or changed, always be suspicious of. And Kaposi's sarcoma is one of them. Very much seen, it is a form of cancer um, and can be seen in patients with severe HIV um, or just a general weakened immune system. But would you think that was anything harmful? So again, when you're examining your patient, whether it's, you know, if they've got a lower limb ulcer, Look at the toes, look between the toes. I know we have 20 minutes or 10 or an hour if we're lucky. But what I'm saying is our eyes, and very much I agree with what um, Andrew said earlier, our eyes, our hands, and our minds are our best tools. Okay. And just say, just, but you, you know, I agree, you wouldn't naturally assume um, that that could be anything um, so, sin so sinister. So just be vigilant act quickly and refer on, and I would say that with any of the patients we've talked about. So in conclusion, the effective treatment of patients with non-healing wounds, I wish I could give you a really nice pathway to follow, but it's just step back, think why isn't it healing, look at previous, yes, look at previous assessments, but again, I think it's nice to, to, to listen to Renita about, don't label the patients as having a venous leg ulcer. Because we do stereotype, don't we, a venous leg ulcer. Because a venous leg ulcer can become malignant. A venous limb can become arterial, as Leanne has said. 
So our assessment has to start again. If it's not responding, step back and know we're busy. We're on a hamster wheel, jump off it sometimes, which I know is harder said than done. But think about it. What is the cause of this wound? And if you can 100% say that is the cause without, and, and you've eliminated any other causes and it's not responding, fine. And if you don't know, widen your team. You can widen it to two, you can widen it to 20, it doesn't matter. I've referred patients to dermatology with what I think were suspicious lesions and they weren't great because I'm glad they weren't. But, you know, we're being equitable to those patients. Identifying any underlying comorbidities and complications. Assess the status and the needs of the wound, but also of the patient. But inform the patient because some of those wounds will not heal. Some of those wounds are for life. So, you know, look about their choices and what they, and, and, and making their quality of life improve with various things. Rethink, reassess, and refer is, I think, a good indicator. Rethink, what's changed, reassess again, and refer if you're in doubt, because I'd rather be wrong than proved right. And it is teamwork, and I love this, Mother Teresa, and I'm sure some of you have seen this before. You can do what I can't do, and maybe I can do some things that you can't do, but together we make a great team, don't we? So again, thinking about that teamwork. Thank you.